from the regular peer catalog class. Thank you for coming on such short notice. Um, it was, I guess, a day or two yeah. ago that I got a fax from Sharon, who got a fax from someone up in, um, in the Bay Area that Rabbi Yaakov Fogelman was visiting his brother from, from Jerusalem. He's from Jerusalem, his brother lives here. And, and, did, and this, is, this is a man who does not let a blade of grass grow under his feet. He wanted to maximize his time and wanted to speak in as many possible places in as wide a possible radius as he could. And so he's come all the way from San Francisco uh, to, for tonight, actually spent the whole day with us, and it was, it's been wonderful um, to speak about many things. Um, but may, and maybe he'll speak a little bit about the, the uh, Mishnah that we were going to speak about in Pirkei Avot class tonight. Pirkei Avot class. Um, a little bit about about Rabbi Fogelman. He and you'll correct me if I'm oh, sure. if I make a mistake. Unless it's something better than it should be, <laughs> so I'll just keep quiet. Um, uh, Rabbi Fogelman studied at Yeshiva University. He was a close student of the late Rav Soloveitchik. Um, he has a law degree from Harvard Law School, and he's lived in Yerushalayim for over 20 years. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. And he lives. He has the last house in the Jewish quarter. Is that right. In, in, in the old city. Um, and he speaks on, on many, many subjects. He, he writes a weekly... Um, what do you call it? Uh, Parsha Tashavua sheet, which you can get afterwards. Uh, with, they'll, they'll be strategically placed, uh, and it's wonderful, and um, talks on, uh, like I said, a variety of subjects, and tonight he'll speak on... Uh, <laughs> Pirkei Avot, uh, the first few words. All right. It'll, it doesn't matter what we call it, it'll come out the same. <laughs> okay. Torah, we'll talk about right, Torah. Yeah. Okay, and, I'll, and I'm just going to... Yeah. Actually, it just occurred to me this minute there's a mitzvah to emulate God. There is, according to Rambam anyway, we know very little about God. To some extent he's remote from us. The Rambam's God is remote from us. The Baal Shem Tov's God is not remote from us. The Hasidic concept of God is man can get very close to God, actually establish a relationship. Whereas the Rambam uh, is not like that. He's an absolute awe of God but has a heavy sense of the distance between God and man. And to just throw in maybe a bit of a psychoanalytic note on some recent work I did, the Rambam not only feels man is distant from God, I have a hunch he also felt man is distant from man. That the Rambam is in some sense the spiritual ancestor of the Litvaks as opposed to the Baal Shem Tov, who not only stressed that man is close to God, but that man is close to man. And I don't want to dwell on it too much, but I'll just leave you with one tantalizing fact. The Rambam's father was against marriage, finally married because of a persistent dream a woman from a very ignorant family, a butcher's daughter, and she died giving birth to the Rambam. And the father looked down on the mother and on the little Rambam who could not learn as expected at three years old. That's enough. It's another lecture for some time or a study which I'm going to publish. But uh, I occur to me anyway we're supposed to emulate God as we, whatever we know about him. Again, from the Rambam, we know very little. And according to the Rambam, where God is described in any way, it's not a true description so much as posing a model for us. And we'll get into that concept later. So I thought, if I am to emulate God this evening, you've all been waiting at least a few minutes to hear me, I should just tell you two words. Get out. Because that's what God does with his first really significant revelation that works out with man to Avraham. Avraham, according to the Torah, is 75 years old when God finally comes to him. The Rambam uh, collects all the 
background of Avraham's life and says from the age of three, Avraham is thinking and searching. He's not there yet. He keeps up with the idols, but he keeps thinking, who made all this? And the world is not an accident. And it's, it's not just a mess. It's a highly, highly uh, intricately related collection of millions of complex entities. There has to be a mind in back of it. Yeah. And eventually he comes to conviction he should smash the idols. And eventually he comes to the conviction he has to teach everybody else about it. And eventually he comes to the conclusion that God doesn't just mean scientific knowledge, but also human kindness. In my opinion, that's Avraham's innovation. Because Noah and company already know about God's existence. But Avraham somehow connects God not just with Elohim, 86 in Gematria, Hateva, the Lord of Nature, but Avraham sees him more as more than a lawgiver, as more than a master, master, mastermind and computer, but a concerned infinite soul which relates to man. So Avraham saw in his head some Midrashim that by the time of Nimrod uh, throwing him in the furnace miracles are happening, but at least from the simple story in the Torah, it's all in Avraham's head until he's 75 years old. Imagine, he's been waiting and trying to communicate with God for, for 72 years, since he was three, according to the Rambam. And what happens finally? God comes! And God says, get out. That's all he says, really. He doesn't say, Shalom Aleichem, I'm the God you've been dreaming of. Avraham, I'm with you. How are you doing? Just says, get out. Go to the land. And I'll give you a few alternative translations here. Where I will show myself to you, or where I will show yourself to you, or where I will uh, see you at your greatest potential. Visham Ereka. And that's what happens. God just uh, disappears. Quick announcement, get out, and disappears. And then when Avram does come there, it's Israel, to the Holy Land, the pure land, the only pure land, the only holy land, God does appear to him. And Avram begins to really take off like a jet plane in his relationship to God and his ten trials and everything. But it happens in Israel. So my first word I feel that's appropriate in emulating God is to say, get out. And those of us who are in Jewish tradition, every Tish above, sit down in Northern California on the ground with other Jews and mourn. We say, God, we're in exile. God, our land is a desert. God, help us. I suggested a three-word addition to the services, one of my radical proposals, that after all is said and done, <coughs> Someone stand up and make an announcement. One way, seven hundred dollars. Right? <laughs> All of this stuff involves at least ab initio seven hundred dollars. <laughs> and God's finally, after nineteen hundred years, made it happen. Uh, I don't think there's any reasonable secular explanation for it. The three things called holy: the Hebrew tongue, the Jewish people, and the land of Israel. Lashon HaKodesh, Eretz HaKodesh, Am HaKodesh. All three of them suddenly start behaving in ways that, in my opinion, are unexplainable in secular categories. In secular categories, what the Bible predicts, that the land will be empty for thousands of years. The Jews are going to be scattered all over the world. And the land, almost like a personality, will not yield itself to anyone else. Even though the others who were there did fine agriculture and build up other lands, but somehow Israel was basically barren for the last 1900 years. Suddenly it blooms again. Can you explain it? No. That's why it's called Kadosh, a holy land, which does not respond to normal scientific categories. Languages don't come back. Once Latin stopped being spoken as a spoken language, and just used by the church and scholars, it's never going to come back. And that was the position of Hebrew, basically, for the last 1900 years. It's back. 
explainable in linguistic categories? I would say no. It's holy. Same thing with the Jewish people. Lots of people were exiled. That's how smart conquerors dealt with people years ago. They should have done it today too. It would have been the most wonderful thing in the world if a sensible world had ended Germany after World War I. Just ended it. Scatter the people all over, divided among the surrounding countries, and six million Jews wouldn't have died. This is sensible. You don't leave an enemy there to do it again. You don't give back the gun to the guy who's trying to shoot you, unless you're some kind of uh, masochist or, or sadist. I don't know what to call it. Uh, so, Jewish people, like other peoples, were exiled, and you see how quickly in a few generations, people assimilate. There were Sparty communities in the United States in the 16 and 1700s. Nobody killed them, but we don't have a trace of them. New Orleans and so forth, they simply assimilated and intermarried in the pleasant American society. We see today, after just a few generations from the shtetl, anywhere from 30 to 80 percent of Jews are intermarrying and will basically be lost to the faith, their children, their grandchildren, and so forth. Marx, Karl Marx, comes from Rashi, nobody's exam. Rosa Luxemburg comes from the Pnei Yoshua, so forth. All right. So, I think we all have to get that message, and that's what I'm going to try to dwell on tonight, an overview of the whole Torah. I'd like to do the whole Torah. Uh, on one with one foot on the ground <laughs> and uh, try to show an overall plan and purpose which I think is often lacking from religious teaching. Now I'm going on one of two possible assumptions. One assumption which is what I would call truly traditional. I don't like the word orthodox because I don't know what it means quite. I don't think I'm a Greek Christian and when someone calls me orthodox, I, I don't know, the term sounds sort of like fat guy sitting around eating or something. I don't know. It's, <laughs> it's just, uh, it doesn't sound meaningful to me. And the term I would prefer to use is truly traditional. And if I would refer to the Masorati movement, so-called, I would prefer to use the term conservative to the term traditional, because I think it's a more apt description just like I prefer the old-fashioned term health foods to the modern term natural foods because there's nothing more natural than a poison mushroom. <laughs> and it's probably a lot worse for you than all the chemicals in the world put together. So uh, health food is a meaningful term. It describes foods which are healthful. Uh, natural foods just doesn't mean anything because everything in the world is natural, including the human intellect, as Buckminster Fuller defines it. Uh, and similarly, I would say conservative, which denotes a certain temperament, is a more accurate description of that Jewish movement than traditional, which it's not. Because, I'm not saying good or bad, I'm simply saying in terms of accuracy of definition, because the one Jewish tradition is that God, the same God who created the world, which is a very real thing, who made every butterfly and fish and star and all the connections between them, that that same God indeed did reveal himself to man at Sinai, the Jewish people, and gave them a twofold Torah. A written Torah, the five books of Moses. Some, there's a song of the pop, popular Magama duo who say, why did Jews have long noses? To stick them in the five books of Moses, all right? <laughs> the, the anthropological observation is not correct, but it's sort of <laughs> cute thing. They also have a beautiful song called, Who Will Be My Children Zadie If Not Me? Which is very applicable to the assimilation problem I mentioned. As long as there were old grandfathers around, even absolute, uh, how shall I put it, heretics or people detached from the Jewish religion like David Ben-Gurion, they still had Jewish grandfathers. But Ben-Gurion's grandson wouldn't have a Jewish grandfather. And he might even from a kibbutz run off with a girl from Holland or Scandinavia 
And that's the end of that branch of the Jewish people. So there is a problem now that the Jewish grandfathers are gone, the old-time deeply Jewish grandfathers. Uh, who will be my children, Zadie, if not me? This is a song by the Magama Duo, one of the best Jewish music groups. Zadie made us laugh, so he's made us sing and so forth. Okay. So the one theory, or the one, or what Jewish tradition says, what I call the truly traditional, is the Torah is a unified book, not Q's and P's and R's or whatever terms they arbitrarily decide to sections of it, given by God. And this is Jewish tradition, until well, maybe a hundred years ago. Then there's the other view, that it's not. It's what's called the documentary hypothesis, which is taught in schools such as the Hebrew Union College, most universities, Jewish Theological Seminary of America, Reconstruction, Reconstructionist College of Philadelphia, and so forth. And Milton Himmelfarb, who I imagine many of you are familiar with, a secular commentator on Jewish affairs, former editor of Commentary Magazine, Himmelfarb did something very interesting. He made a survey of Jewish theology. He gathered together the four major denominations, let's call them, what he calls orthodox, conservative, reform, and reconstructionist. He was a little narrow. He didn't invite any Karaites or Samaritans. There's still some around. And he asked the leaders of these four denominations, what do you believe about this book called the Torah? Now, that's a nice, vague question. I can say the Torah is divine, and five people who will say that will have five different meanings in their mind or concepts. Mr. Himmelfarb is a very clever fellow. So instead of asking that question, he said, this book called the Torah, which claims to be the word of God, says you mustn't have wool and linen in your garments. This is one of like four questions he asked each participant. Do you believe it? Did God really say this? Do you do anything about it? Which is a sign if you believe it. What was very interesting is in every one of these questions, every participant, except those called orthodox, which I prefer the term truly traditional, said, we really don't. Okay. And with the exception of Jacob Neusner, a leading conservative scholar, formerly of Brown, now in Miami, who was in a religious mood that day, he changes <laughs> back and forth, and... Uh, <laughs> There are a number of people like that who are simply ambivalent. And Neusner said, yes, I believe it, and I do it. But he was the only one of the non-Orthodox. And the conclusion of Milton Himmelfarb was that there are only two Jewish theologies, not four. That God gave the Torah, and it's binding for all times, written and oral. Or he didn't. That's a collection of old documents which someone like Ezra got together at some point in history. And he said the Orthodox are the only ones with the first view. And there are a few conservative people. I spoke to one of the world's greatest Torah scholars and religious personalities, David Halivni Weiss, a few weeks ago. And he certainly affirms that, the position which we usually call Orthodox. And he left, the, he was the leading professor of Talmud at the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. And he left there five years ago in protest against their abandoning tradition and founded his own school, I forget what it's called, uh, in Tianek, New Jersey, United Torah Judaism in Tianek, New Jersey. And he has a following among the more traditional conservative rabbis who indeed do believe that the Torah is from heaven, even if they may feel that the Jewish women aren't so attractive and distracting that they interfere with men's prayers. All right, that's debatable. So anyway, uh, uh, so these are the two views. I am going to take the view that's given in Pirkei Avot. Even if one doesn't agree with it, I'm presenting that view. I'm presenting the view, the truly traditional view, which is the root of everything in Pirkei Avot. Pirkei Avot starts not just with ethics or pretty ideas. Moshe Kibel Torah Misinai. Moses received the Torah at Sinai. And he handed on to Yeshua and so forth. It establishes the chain of tradition from Moses on down through the times of the Mishnah. 
and gives salient leading statements by the various rabbis in the Mishnah. And then the Rambam, Maimonides, poor little Rambam, took it up from there in his introduction to the Mishnah, which is a very elitist document, and he traced it down to his day and showed how each person is ordained or certified by the one before him. In other words, I am authorized to teach the Torah because my predecessor in the chain from Moses, Rabbi Soloveitchik, urged me to teach the Torah. If he didn't, I'm not allowed to do so. Once Rav Mufhak, his outstanding teacher, who is in the chain, this is very important, must give authority for you to pass on the chain. So, I'm basing what I say on this view. So we'll do the entire Torah based on this view and try to see if we do consider it one cohesive book given by God. So what is the cohesion? How do the five books relate? Now the problem isn't quite as bad as I make it because when we say five books, it's still one scroll of the Torah, but there is a definable space in the Torah between each of what we call the five books. And those people who call themselves scientific, I have no idea what it means because they can't make these nice tape recorders or anything, but they say they're scientific scholars of Judaism. It sounds good. Uh, uh, they, like the Encyclopedia Judaica, most uh, professors at the university and so forth, uh, uh, claim that these books just come from different sources and in their Bible called the Encyclopedia Judaica for example they'll show you how each book really was originally not part of the Torah. I say this to clarify so one understands that modern works such as the Judaica do not reflect the traditional Jewish position that the Torah is one entity given by God. They clearly do not reflect this. Moshe Greenberg writes some of the articles. In my study sheets, I've tried to take the points he brings and one by one show why I think they're wrong. But then I have to show, again, why there's a division into five books. So I'm going to propose a scheme. This is my own, blended from Rep. Soloveitch and Rabbi Sam Raphael Hirsch. Uh, there is a new book called Unity of the Torah. I think his name is Hollingsworth, something like that. He's a professor of Yeshiva University who shows that the same themes occur in all five books. But in each book has a major theme, a light motif, which is then a minor theme in the other four books. And this may suggest to you the imagery of a symphony, where you have light motifs and sub motifs going throughout. And I think it's on back of this week's sheet in my magnum opus, uh, yes, I brought the Symphony of Free Will Time. I don't know if the guy is Jewish or not, but it's by a very brilliant man, or at least he uses big words, uh, who uh, expresses the Bible as being a symphony. It's O.R. Dialonis, Musical Variations on Jewish Thought. Uh, so you might want to look at that, that I won't go, you know him? Jewish? No. No? Brilliant? No, he's Italian. Brilliant? Yeah. That was my impression. Uh, okay. Uh, you don't have to be Jewish to eat Levy's rye bread. I guess you don't have to be you know, you can always Jewish to Jewish. read the Torah. Yeah. I'm not, uh, I, I'm one of those in Jerusalem who urges people not to over-Jew it. And I, I, I mean that. Uh, see, here we got the opposite problem. Everything is universal. Right. And you've got to be ashamed of saying not only that Jews are different from non-Jews, but that men are different from women. Uh, but all right. <laughs> and in Jerusalem, we have the opposite problem, that they stress the Jewish differences too much. And uh, I have a friend who's a wonderful spiritual boy, a descendant of the Shla, great holy rabbi, a really great spiritual person and singer. And I brought him to my house once to hear my latest Hasidic tape that I purchased. Mm -hmm. And he really got into it, and he was dancing and singing. And then at the end I told him it was a Cypriot tape. <laughs> Greek Cypriot, not Turkish Cypriot. And uh, why? Because in his context, he knew this sort of spirit only as Jewish. And therefore he associated it as being Jewish, just as Americans 
even Jewish ones would associate borscht and other Russian foods with being Jewish, or would associate falafel and other Mideastern foods with being Israeli, which they're not. So, back to the Torah. I would say we find the theme of the whole Torah in the beginning of the first book, Bereshi. What two items which are predominantly featured throughout the Torah are missing from its beginning chapters? Any suggestions? Two items which are found throughout the Torah are missing from the first chapters. Good. Not the birth of the blues, but the birth of the Jews. Right? <laughs> Nowhere in the Parshat Bereshit Noach is, it ex- is there any specific reference to a concept of a chosen people. There's just mankind. Adam on down. And what goes with the Jews that's missing from Bereshit? I know it's a little difficult to express in this setting. The commandments. commandments you have there a bit. You have Puravu, the first thing to have babies. Mm-hmm. It, you don't even need religion for it, it's natural. And then when, when some kind of odd Western society divorces sex from having babies and treats sex as a snack, so there's an innate sense in those people that they're not living naturally. Forget religiously. They're not living naturally as mammals. And therefore, you have to have what psychologists would call a compensatory device, like doing all kinds of over-demonstrations of how natural you are, like the over-Jewing it, like making sure you eat lots of health foods and jog, and only buy wooden plane toys from Finland for your children, (laughs) from the Harvard Coop or the Santa Cruz equivalent, it's trafe and puzzle to buy the more appealing, colorful plastic toys from Korea at the Kmart. It's just not nice to do that. It's not politically correct. All right? So this is just a brief uh, response to Western civilization. Anyway, we do have a mitzvah, Pruervu, and later come other mitzvahs to guard the garden. What else besides the Jewish people as a distinct entity is missing? Just like you can, I'm sorry? The covenant. The covenant. Well, that's unique Jewish again. Yeah. Uh, it's like having, you know, bagels without locks or locks without bagels. Then if the Jews aren't there, what else isn't there? You should know this. Why let them do that? Why not you? <laughs> the place where there are no men. We have that statement also. The Makam Shaini, Shishtadeliotish, and Perkeavot. Where there is no man, strive to be one. Land of Israel. Okay. There's no mention of a special people, and there's no mention of a special land. There are all kinds of hints. She said, well, wait, 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 she said, said but it, yeah, yeah, and I include the people. that. There, oh, well, they say it's a different thing. But there's no holy land, and there's no holy people. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. That's Avraham. First few chapters. Oh, you're just saying uh, right, 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 right. No, until... first 11 chapters. Fine. Okay? Until Lech Lecha. First two Parshas. Until Parshat Lech Lecha, when God tells Avram, get out, there's no unique people and there's no unique land. The two go together. Again. Unless you consider Gan Eden. Gan Eden is universal. Some say it was in Israel or from the land of Israel, whatever. There are concepts there, which I'll get to, that Eretz Yisrael is the way back to God Eden. So what happens? God creates universal man, not Jewish man, and he places him in God Eden to guard it, to keep it, and man suddenly leaves this idyllic relationship with God and goes off to do his own thing. I uh, compare it to a teenager who tells his parents, I'm leaving this house, and I'll never come back again. And the parents tempted to ask, is that a promise? (laughs) But at the same time, you keep his room exactly as it was, with the hope that someday he or she will return. 
That's the story pretty much of Gan Eden. Man messes it up with a sin. If I were to give two basic categories of sin, in which category would you place the sin of eating eight sadas? In motivational categories, it's a sin of... All right, there's two categories in Judaism of sin. They even rhyme, suggesting a connection. Yes, positive and negative. Uh, but here I would use, as I said, categories of motivation, not of uh, whether it's action or, or non-action. Out of ignorance? No, uh, you could say that, but that's, that's a possible answer. What I have in mind is ta'ava and ga'ava. The two things which take man off the straight path are ta'ava over physical passion, over sensuality, and ga'ava, too much pride, too much aggrandizement. Those are two basic categories of sin, and individuals and cultures are prone to one or the other, usually. Not necessarily to both. The first sin of Adam and Eve is a sin of ta'ava. The uh, fruit, whatever it was, is appealing, looks tasty, smells nice. They eat it. But you can also say it's ga'ava. They have the desire to know over a man. Yes. They know more than they're supposed to know. Except that it's not so clear that they know that consequence. The Torah says she saw that it was tasty and beautiful and so forth. Perhaps. But the the apparent theme seems to be ta'ava. That sin goes wholesale. God, according to Rav Salavechik, acquiesces to Adam and Eve's wish to do their own thing, like the teenager, and doesn't expel them from the Gan Eden so much as agreeing that they can leave because they really don't want to be so close to God and want to do their own thing. But he puts there two angels with flaming swords to guard the way to the tree of life, not to guard in a sense that it's a barrier against their coming back, but to guard in the sense of Shemirat Shabbat, that you're preserving it, you're keeping it. Just finish this thought, okay? That the two angels are keeping the path open to the tree of life, keeping the teenager's room ready for when he's ready to come back. And all the time in every life, no matter what physical problems, and all life is a fatal disease, it ends in death. <laughs> Still, the way to the tree of eternal life is always there. <laughs> the Torah itself, developing an intense relationship with infinity itself, with God, is a way of experiencing eternity while still in the transient existence. It's a way of linking up to that transcending, linking up to that beyond my normal existence as a mammal. All right? Now, that's the story of Gan Eden, but before, I'll take a question. Do I prefer if questions can be at the end, if yeah, possible? Yeah, that's, that's what I want to, uh, yeah, please. Okay, I'm sorry, yeah. yeah, no, it's all right, but that's just my yeah. style. Actually, it's usually not my style, but this is the grand lecture where I got to do the whole Torah quickly. Uh, <laughs> My, my, my style is Talmudic to get off on oh, a yes, tangent and forget the subject. All right. Uh, before we get to the sin in Gan Eden itself, there's something comes before it. God creates everything in the universe in stages roughly corresponding to the alleged evolutionary cycle, which I happen to think is nonsense, by the way, not for religious reasons, just for common sense reasons. Because if there were Darwin's gradual evolution, you wouldn't see species. You'd see a continuum of existence because the changes are so slow. But all right. and, and the better theory is body by Fisher, the theory we have in Boratius, where I don't claim just because a Cadillac so much re resembles a Chevrolet that the Cadillac somehow magically evolved from the Chevrolet, but I say body by Fisher, they have a common designer who makes simpler and more complex models, all of which have some similar components in structure and design. So God, of course, there's resemblance between everything in the universe because it's the same God who made it. And, Dar and I found out that my question on Darwin's theory was asked by someone way before me. Guess who? Darwin. 
Darwin didn't just ask about the missing link. All the links are missing. There should be trillions and trillions of links, no definable species. But what Darwin said oh, a couple hundred years ago was, well, we haven't explored the whole world yet. He took a boat and tried to explore some of it. And if we explore enough, we'll find them. Now we've explored and we didn't. So body by Fisher, I think, is far more sensible than Darwinian evolution, though there is limited evolution within each species. We see that. The Japanese who come to America get bigger and lighter and so forth, but they don't turn into something else. Uh, so uh, anyway, God makes all the creatures in the world, all life, all inanimate matter, and then there's one difference when he's about to make man. What's the difference? Actually, by male, at first he does it, but then he stresses, he, does he stresses so he male and female, and right? And female but uh, good. What else? What other difference? Yeah, but before that, before he does it, he makes an announcement. Everything else, he just does it. Let there be light. There's light. He doesn't say, "Let there be man," and there's man. He says, let us make man in our image. Why? What difference is there by man? And, of course, the big question is, who is us? God's addressing someone here as us. Not as Sir Adam, but some It's like the thesis review committee. It's like the thesis review committee. Mm -hmm. says, what do you think if we do this? Yeah, right. Some say it's the majestic uh, plural. The king says what we do, or when my tiny little under finance organization does a partial sheet, I say we said this the previous year. <laughs> but the problem is he doesn't do that by all the other acts of creation. So I would reject the majestic divine as the uh, explanation of us. So there are two in the Medrash. One is God addresses angels. There's such a thing as Malachim. They're found in the book of Tehillim and so <coughs> forth, Shayahu, Chesko. The biblical view is there's some entity called the Malach, and Rev Her Malach simply means one who does Malacha or work, where God does not appear directly, but does what he does in this world through agencies. And Rev Hirsch points out in Tehillim the agencies can either be natural forces, Ose Malachav Ruchot, winds, laser beams, radio beams, whatever. Or they can be some kind of supernatural, invisible being called angels. Sometimes that's clearly <coughs> the meaning. Or it can be a person who, who is in a providential position to carry out God's work. Moshe is referred to as a malach, <coughs> who's God's messenger, and so forth. Okay? So if God is addressing the angels, let us create man. <coughs> in our image, it would mean there's some of the qualities of the angel besides the qualities of God in man. And why is God telling us this, the rabbis say? To teach you that the small should always be consulted by the great. God needs no advice. God knows everything. But still God consulted in the Bible with the angels to teach man, no matter how arrogant and how knowledgeable and how rich and how powerful, Marba Eitzah, Marba Tavuna. I'll try to bring Pirkei Avot in occasionally. He who uh, multiplies consultation, advice, multiplies understanding. Ezel Chacham, who is wise, Hello made me call Adam, someone who's prepared to learn from everyone, every human being, Jew, non-Jew, child, adult, animal, anything. To learn from everything. So God gives man a moral example. Again, going back to the Rambam, <coughs> we can't really know God, but as he images himself, metaphorically in the Bible, he is giving us moral models to emulate, both to be powerful and to be kind. For example, the Rambam brings, just as he is merciful, you be merciful, and just as he is great and powerful, don't be a nevish. Develop all the human faculties which God gave you. I, uh, holy beggars can be uh, never. <laughs> Depends whether you have a Karbakian point of view or a Maimonidean. Uh, anyway, 
Any other suggestions? Let us make man in our image, whom it's addressed to? The animals. Animals, not just animals, but the whole preceding creation. And then this is the beautiful Kabbalistic notion. I'm a reformed Kabbalist. I'm a truly traditional Jew, I hope, who believes the Torah is from God. But the Kabbalah is less certain, and there's many versions of the Kabbalah. So I take that which seems the most sensible to me, which is, unfortunately, the reform approach to the Torah itself. And one Kabbalistic view I like very much is the notion of the man being a microcosmos. That everything in the universe is somehow incorporated into man, both intellectually and experientially, and perhaps physically. Again, the human fetus resembling a fish, that may be the fish in man. And that my mind can somehow work out the mathematical uh, formulae by which stars orbit, awesome. We're all part of a system. Awesome. So man is a microcosmos who, in a sense, relates to everything else in the universe. According to those who believe in reincarnation, and I stress that those who believe, which means the Ari and the, Zo the Zohar and the Ari, and all the Hasidim and Sephardim who follow the Zohar and the Ari, as opposed to the Sajid Gaon and Yosef Albo and others, who, and Rab Kapach's grandfather, who say that that stuff is nonsense and no Jew should believe in it. As opposed to the Abarbanel, the great rationalist and Kissinger of his day, but a holy Kissinger, who said that reincarnation is important because without it so many people's lives make no sense. And thank God the Greeks discovered it. So you have three views of reincarnation. Holy wisdom, Goyish wisdom, or Goyish nonsense. Take your pick. Uh, anyway, those who do believe in it, I asked the Boston the Rebbe, do you really believe that cat could be my great-great-grandmother? <laughs> and that that tree might be my great-great-grandfather? And uh, that in effect then that the tree and the cat also become an image of God. So the Rebbe answered me very wisely very nice man too he said that no it doesn't mean all of you goes into the cat it means if you did not sanctify and develop properly into a human form into an image of God the cat part of you then that part goes into a cat interesting okay anyway man is a microcosmos according to the Kabbalah does anyone have another interpretation of who us is let us make man in our image give you Reb Soloveitchik's, which is my favorite. God is addressing the man he's about to create. I was going to say that. Okay. Good for you. About to create kind of... Yeah, I just yes, added that. Yes. No, it's yes. like poetic. God yes. is speaking yes. to this man he's about to create, like the lady speaking to the cake, rise, my rise, my cake. <laughs> so, uh, the cake analogy will come in later. It's a very good one. Uh, so, anyway, God says... God makes everything in the universe to function on automatic. It's like a computer built into every flower, every butterfly, mm -hmm. every uh, snowflake, and every star. And it just does what it's supposed to do. It can't be good or bad. Whereas man is also like that in his body, but that's not his essence. His essence, and maybe even the mind is part of the body, but his essence this is the Shema, his soul, his image of God. And that is not given to him automatic or pre-developed. But God says, you and I together, you need my help. You've got to pray for it too. You and I together will develop your divine image into a reality. To bring God into the world via your own personhood. All right, fine. So man has his task. And then as I mentioned, he flops in pleasure trips like the fruit which then is franchised and goes wholesale in the flood generation, where all flesh corrupts its way upon the earth, where perversions become called alternative lifestyles, and <laughs> the sin of eating the fruit is followed by what? Another sin. Cain kills Abel, P.S., in the religious battle. And uh, this is not a sin of Ta'ava, a physical passion, but it's a sin of ga'ava, of pride and aggrandizement. And that sin gets franchised and goes wholesale 
in the second generation, the Tower of Babel, where mass society and its leaders attempt to impose one language and one thought pattern on everyone. And as the rabbis say, they mourn if a brick breaks in the five-year plan, but not if a man dies. A depersonalized society with lack of individuality. And Rabbi Soloveitchik, many years ago, said that those two societies in our day represent the Western world of decadence and ta'ava, the so-called playboy civilization. And the Eastern Bloc, the communist bloc, represented the world of ga'ava, of repression of the individual, of inhuman cruelty. And what does God do? Interestingly enough, the guys from the flood generation are not rebels against God, really. They just like to fress. Or they may not even be bad people. The person on drugs who uh, attacks the elderly person might under normal circumstances be a very nice person who would help the elderly person across the street. But in the grips of their inflated passions, they just do anything. It becomes Hamas, violence at a certain point, and that's when God cracks down. They wash themselves out. There's a flood. And the guys who rebel against God, according to our tradition, to build a tower to heaven, God isn't so hard on them. He just scatters their imposed bad unity. The UN is not always good. Unity is not always good. It can be used for repressive and bad purposes. And Reb Soloveitchik many years ago said that's the Soviet bloc. God will scatter it. This is way before anyone dreamed such a thing would happen. But he said, it's the Tower of Babel. God has to scatter their languages. Their attempt at wicked unity, at godless unity, unity against God. The American uh, astronaut goes out into space with his Jewish biblical tradition of the OT, the Only Testament. And he says, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. The Russian astronaut a cosmonaut. It is not just a coincidence. When he goes out in space, he's got nothing else to talk about except, I didn't see God out there. You see how central this issue is of God's existence and revelation to the cultures of mankind. So that's what happens to collective man, whom God wanted to be close to him in Eden, but gave free will to. That he vacillates between pleasure trips and power trips the uh, beat generation, and the yuppies, and never achieves a relationship to God. We're almost done with Act 1, the first book of the Torah. So therefore, since Adam messed it up, we have created... creation, destruction, and recreation through Avraham and his descendants. I, maybe later if we have time I'll go through the differences, but let me at this point suffice to say that the various aspects of human development are not completed until the con contrasting aspects of Avraham and Yitzchak merge in Yaakov, Yisrael, uh, who's called Tiferes, or emes in Kabbalah, glory or truth, who merges the chesed, the extrovert qualities of Avraham, with the introvert disciplinary qualities of Yitzchak called Gevura. Right? We now should finish the book of Genesis at this point, because we now have a model man from whom God can bring the rest of the world back. However, 
there's a problem. The people normally do not live as individuals if they're healthy. They get married, say the age of 18, 19, when the sexual drive is its biological peak, and have babies. This is, an, as I pointed out before, a natural, normal way to live. So therefore, to have a model for man, it's not enough just to have a great individual, but you need that individual to succeed in something which unfortunately these days especially, many individuals fail in, to create a functional good family, children. And that's the rest of Beratius. Yaakov almost fails, they almost kill each other, Yehuda assimilates, he goes down to Elat without leaving Israel. And uh, it looks pretty bad there with Joseph in Egypt. Suddenly, everything is good, and therefore the book ends where it ends, with Yaakov and all his sons gathered around his bedside as he lays dying and predicts their future and blesses them. Now you see a perfectly natural end to the book of Beratia. We finished the main foundation of the Bible, volume one. Volume 2, Exodus, then goes on to deal with another problem. Perhaps naturally, perhaps artificially, man chooses to live not just in families, but in nations or civilizations or cultures. Therefore, it's not enough to have a family of Yaakov, of Yisrael, but you need a people, a nation of Israel, to be a model for the whole world how to live as a nation. The emergence of that nation is the story of the book of Exodus. Because if we say it's the story of the Jews in Egypt, the Jews are already in Egypt for the last few sidras, the last few portions of the book of Beratia. Yaakov and his family are in Egypt. But that's not the message. It's the development of individual and the development of family to recreate creation. And then the development of a national entity to do that from the Holy Land to which they're taken out. And in Exodus 19.6, the Jews, upon receiving the Decalogue, which has nothing to do with non-Jews, this is another common misconception that the Ten Commandments is our universal religion. The Ten Commandments is only addressed to the Jews, to be grammatically correct, addressed only to the Jews. And, uh, in addition, it contains subject matter, major subject matter, which only the Jews are supposed to do. Gentiles are discouraged from it, keeping the Sabbath. That's one of the Decalogue. Okay? We do have a universal religion for all men. It's called the Seven Laws of Noah. And I designed a bumper sticker. Forgot to bring some. Keep the seven, go to heaven. Uh, my institution is also a uh, center for Gentiles interested in Judaism, and we discourage people from becoming Jewish. But we do have something to say. Every human being can affiliate with the Torah and the Jewish people, and many are beginning to, as predicted, as by becoming one, a Noahide, not a Jew. Like Noah, he's Sadiq, very righteous man, walked with God, a good Vermonter. Okay? So, Exodus 19.6, God says, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That double phrase upon the Jews receiving the Decalogue is not simple. Why two phrases? So the best explanation I have seen is from one of the world's greatest Torah scholars who unfortunately is little known, I'd say simply because he hasn't been translated into English, uh, Rabbi David Hoffman, who was a great Torah scholar who also mastered the so-called science, the pseudo-science of Bible criticism, so in their own terms he could answer the Bible critics, and he did. Uh, he may be even greater than Hirsch as a rabbi in Germany. Uh, so anyway, uh, he explained kingdom of priests means people who are really God-involved. And we're the people who doesn't go to the bathroom without making a blessing. One of the most inspiring blessings in the Jewish religion is the blessing after the going to the bathroom, which loosely uh, summarized is, wow, it worked again. <laughs> in other words, the whole digestive process, 
my functioning of my body, something we take for granted and never think about in religious terms, is considered a great miracle. And that miracle is not experienced at the moment of eating, because nothing much happens then. That miracle is experienced when the food has completed the cycle. And the blessing reads, God, uh, who created man with wisdom and with so many complex organs and channels, and it's well known before your throne, if one of these things would get stopped up or one would get opened up which is supposed to be closed, picture your plumbing in your house, uh, it would be impossible to exist and stand before you. Thank God it's working. Who heals all flesh and does wonders and miracles. That each time a Jew goes to the laboratory, he has to make that blessing. One of the most inspiring religious experiences I ever had was happening to go to the laboratory with Rabbi Dr. Eliezer Berkowitz, so great Jewish scholar and theologian from Chicago, originally from Germany. And when he left the lavatory, he was an older man at the time. And when you're older, you don't take the body so much for granted. And he said that Pennsylvania Dutch say, too soon old, too late smart. Uh, after going to the bathroom, he said that bracha slowly. It was such kavana on every word. It was a great religious experience to hear him. Similarly, a Jew is not allowed to drink a glass of water or eat a candy bar or anything without making blessings. To raise his consciousness that at this moment it's divine will which is providing him with that candy bar. And if he's eating something more significant, a uh, vegetative product, fruit or vegetables, he has to make special brachas which remind him of the miracle of growth of a tree and a miracle of growth of a vegetable. And if he's eating bread, already a really significant eating, he has to remind himself, as the Vilna Goan says, ha motzi lecha min ha'aretz, that God brings food and sustenance to the whole world from the land of Israel. Just as all the prayers are believed to somehow ascend to God through Jerusalem, so all blessing is believed to come to the world, not min ha'adama from the earth, like vegetables, but min ha'aretz from the land of Israel. So the Vilna Gaon explains the bracha. And, and as we learn in Pirkei Avot, I'll just from time to time refer to Avot since that's your context. Uh, if Jews don't keep the law properly in Israel, like sabbatical year and so forth, famine comes to the world. It doesn't say to Israel, to the world. So there's cosmic significance in how the Jews live in the state of Israel. Okay? So that's a kingdom of priests, those who keep all these holy laws. But as a kingdom of priests, as I've given you the biblical overview, as a kingdom of priests, I'll imitate Reb Soloveitchik. Once his keeper fell off, we kept talking. We were a keeper. We're supposed to remind ourselves of God. We don't have to be obsessive about it if it falls off for a second. All right, so as a kingdom of priests, we'll never be a model to bring mankind back because a priest is not a model for a congregation. He's a priest. In order to really be an effective model, we have to set up a nation which does everything a nation does. Agriculture, medical research, police, army, whatever a nation has to do. But each thing in that nation it should be goy kodosh, should be holy. Again, like the Jews, the language, and the land. Things transcending the normal limits of physical reality even. The sense of specialness about it. I urge the Jewish National Fund, instead of playing pine trees, which are boring all over the place, to put biblical fruit trees. And this will be the land where every guy can just walk through and eat without pay. <laughs> but all right, they, they're not so imaginative. Uh, and also we have a campaign to change Hatikva. I mean this sincerely. I urge every person in this room to make a one-word change when you sing Hatikva. Everything in Hatikva is nice if you do this one-word change. Otherwise, it's an abomination. Really. That the Jewish people should not include this mission and God and holiness in their national anthem when other countries like America do in England is a uh, Chilol Hashem. And Rabbi Vadya Yosef is right in not singing it. However, if the Jewish people hop onto something so strongly, there must be an innate possibility of holiness in it. 
and it's much nicer solution to find, make it somehow acceptable. Like everything is approved in Israel, you approve Hatik for two. So it is our hope to be a free people in our land. But just to be another California or Western nation is not our hope of thousands of years. It's Leotam Kadosh Be'ar Seni. To be a holy people in our land. And because it's the land of Israel, Jerusalem, and Jerusalem symbolizes that holy aspect. Kibbutz, wonderful idea. Well, it should be a religious kibbutz. Army, great mitzvah. Avraham and Yaakov did it. To defend against murderers is a great mitzvah. A pacifist is an accomplice to murder. Quaker position in World War II is support of Hitler de facto. But an army must be holy. No cheapness. Care to minimize death. Care to stop the enemy without killing him if possible. And a certain sense of sadness about it all. Not the joy of war. You got to do it. No one braver than Israeli boys. My own son was in Mifsah Shlomo with the Ethiopians, with special missions. It's an awesome thing which Americans can't appreciate so much because they don't experience this reality. Right? So every aspect which a nation normally does must be done by the Jews. We're not just a religion, a spiritual people. We're to make a real live land, a nation, a state of Israel, to which every single Jew in the world will come and contribute whatever they can contribute to making it a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So there's our mission. Now at this point I will interrupt with a commercial from the Encyclopedia Judaica. <laughs> Despite the, I think, very reasonable exposition I've given, if I remember it's Moshe Greenberg or Sarna, one of them, Greenberg I think, says, well, the names of the Jews are repeated at the beginning of the book of Exodus, even though they've already been listed in Genesis, in case somebody didn't have the book of Genesis, because they never really came together at the same time. So therefore, they were repeated. That's what he says. That's his argument. All right, it's an argument. I don't know if I call it science, the scientific method. It's a, a point. However, the Jews well before him, people like Rashi and the Ramban and the Talmud, they were aware of this very obvious repetition. And they gave different explanations. Rashi, and both are beautiful that I know. Rashi's is just like a miser counts his money and a businessman every day takes a mental inventory. So God loves the Jews and he likes to keep repeating their names. And in other words, the Bible is not just different. See, it's like a vicious cycle. The university approach will say, well, we must look at this as a collection of information and they a priori are blind to the possibility that this is God speaking to man and establishing a relationship and relationships, you repeat the name. Yaakov looks in Rachel's eyes. He might just say, Rachel, Rachel, even though one time is sufficient to get her attention. And God says, Avraham, Avraham, Lashen Chiba, or Moshe, Moshe. Now, it's true. The old Yiddish lady on the east side calling down from the seventh floor to her son who's about to smash a window, Moshe, Moshe, is calling twice to get his attention. But God, like uh, postman never rings twice, God doesn't have to call twice. If Shalamat Aloni would suddenly hear from the sky, Shalamat! Next day she'd be in Beis Yatov. One time is sufficient to get attention and obedience. But Rashi stresses then that the Kriya is Lashon Chiba, which is a, con a consistent theme of Rashi. And a perfectly beautiful theme, and no need to say, oh, well, these were old books and traditions that somebody put together once, just because the names of the people of Israel are repeated. But Rev Hirsch, as usual, in my opinion, coming later and assimilating Rashi and the Ramban, not only puts them together, but often has much deeper messages. And Rev Hirsch says, since we describe this as the beginning of Jewish nationhood, the Jewish people is different from every other nation in that it doesn't put the nation first. That our nation is only as strong as the individuality, as I stressed before, against the Tower of Babel. And the family structure, as I said, well, we're finishing the book of Exodus this coming Shabbat, the good Lord willing, with the account of the tabernacle, which is so important, apparently. There's more than four sections of the Torah devoted to it. And it's apparently of eternal significance. 
And not just for the third temple, may it come soon in our days. So, what is this end? And then the cloud of glory comes down and said the grand finale, the tabernacle is erected and God's glory appears. So again, in comes the Encyclopedia Judaica in Greenberg. Well, you see, uh, they didn't have the book of Numbers. And therefore, in case somebody should, God forbid, miss out on the book of Numbers, they put in the scene of the clouds of glory coming down from the book of Numbers. I mean, it doesn't, forget scientific, it doesn't even sound too sensible. Again, many years, many hundreds of years before the Hebrew University even existed. Uh, the Rambam dealt with that problem. And he said, of course, because the Jews are just to be a secular nation in our land. Otherwise, there's no reason to etra for all that sacrifice and suffering. It's not important then. But we're to be a holy people in our land. And that holiness is manifest by God's constant presence in our midst. The clouds coming down in the tabernacle, just as his presence constantly accompanied the patriarchs through all their trials and travails. Magnificent. Simple. Fine. Now we go on to the third book, starting Mincha de Shabbos, the book of Ayikra. I said I'm going to do the whole Torah. I, I meant it. The book of Ayikra, does anyone know its other name, its popular Jewish name? Leviticus is its English name. Torah Kohanim. The Torah, the law of the priest. Now the Ramban says, since I praise the Ramban, now I'll criticize him. The Ramban says, I'll show you how all the laws in Vayikra relate to the priest. It's called the Torah of the priest. The only problem is, the best I can see, he didn't. The first part about sacrifices, animal sacrifices, an institution in which Western liberal man ardently believes. You can go in your shops down the street. They sacrifice animals for Gucci shoes, for hot dogs, for all sorts of things. But it's politically incorrect to conceive that somehow it could be a religious experience. That's not nice, because non-Jews might not think well of us should we advertise those views. All right. Anyway, so the problem is to show how the book of Leviticus of Vayikra is indeed Torah Kohanim. So again, to the rescue comes Reb David Hoffman beautifully and consistently with his earlier theory and says it is the laws of the priests, not Aaron and company, but the Jewish people who have just been called the kingdom of priests. But in Judaism, it's not enough to have vague sentiments about being religious and God and nice to your fellow man and all that. There have to be very concrete, detailed laws of behavior. Anyone who eats something without making a blessing is like stealing from God. Uh, certain foods you may never eat. Sex, beautiful, fine, the way images of God are created. But not sex as a snack. Sex should, sex should be holy. Uh, in Jewish religion, one's not even allowed to dance with someone else's wife. Uh, and so forth. Uh, clothes, sure. Have nice clothes. No wool and linen. Every realm has certain specific, detailed behavior that goes with it. And that's the book of Leviticus. So now, we're about to bake the cake. We got everything. We got the recipe. We've got the ingredients. We've got the tools. So let's do it. That's the fourth book of the Torah, by Midbar. The actual experience, and again, there's a little of each of these themes in each of the other books, but like men and women, there's a light motif and sub-motif in each book. And again, I would challenge, I imagine there's some scientist in this room, I would challenge any scientist, even one who doesn't believe in that silly theory of evolution, that's just my view. I mean, you can be perfectly religious and believe in it. There's no Torah problem involved. But uh, why do I have breasts? They don't work. They do work? How? Well, I mean, men can work. Can. But I'm not going to, I'm not going to nurse a child that way. It, it, they just, they're there. And we don't use them for anything. There is a theoretical possibility that can happen. I know that. No, but but good point. But they, still, they basically, have, they, they don't have work. A purpose. They're, they're, they're told for sexual attraction. Hmm? Uh, women, are, women are sexually attracted physiologically to, to men, to, 
to the breast, to the, to the chest. What's the evidence for such a thing? The chest, maybe. The breast, I, you have to differentiate each item. The hairy chest image, maybe. The breast as such, I would uh, have a hunch not generally, or certainly not significantly. The, I would say from a Jewish standpoint, which I've been expounding, it's perfectly sensible. God has this grand school. The formal text is the Torah, written and oral. But he also has an audiovisual division. It's called the world. In other words, the Jewish concept is clearly that everything I meet and experience, besides its utilitarian value, has a message from God. And I would say the message is beautiful here. That I have a little bit of the nurture in me as a male, but that's not my essence. Okay? Very simple message, obvious to most cultures who aren't too sophisticated. That the male is a little bit of a nurturer, but that's not his prime function. And uh, against the Lamaze lie. You know what the Lamaze lie is? You're having the baby too. <laughs> the most ridiculous statement I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> uh, I can empathize with my wife who's having the baby. I can try to help her. It's a mitzvah. But to say I'm having the baby too. Ridiculous. So I have the vestiges of breast. And the female organs are the real flip side of that. There's the vestige of masculinity and maybe of aggression and conquest. Uh, as we know from southern novels and Sigmund Freud and all, one who protests too much, the man who will never change a diaper, or the woman who will never drive a truck, it's a sign of actual doubt about their sexual identity. But still, there's light motif and sub-motif. And I always felt, this is just my subjective thing, don't blame the religion if you don't like it, I always felt that uh, the ideal Jewish image of man and woman as in the TV series, Little House on the Prairie. He, he's a real man, but he also has a gentle side. And she's a real woman, but also has a tough side. Uh, Freud uh, spoke about the bisexual nature of man. And Freud was a real man. And Freud was terrible as a real man. And should be condemned. What that guy did is he took his nice religious wife and made her be non-religious. Really. It's in the recent biography of Freud. I didn't know this till about a week or two ago. And then I, what I did know is who his wife was. Does anyone know who his wife's Jewish significance? His wife is the granddaughter of Samson Raphael Hirsch's Rebbe, Rav Bernays. Really. Her name was Mar Martha Bernays. And what I didn't know until a week ago, I was wondering, so how could she come from such an illustrious religious family and, and uh, live so then Jewishly? The answer is he made her. He absolutely insisted there'd be no religion in his house. His granddaughter wound up being like a feature in a Playboy-type magazine, incidentally. But yet Freud led a basically normal life, and he had a whole bunch of children. And he was a kind man. He treated people for nothing, even when he was ill with cancer in his later years. And he refused to take any money for royalties on the Hebrew and Yiddish translations of his works. And was involved in setting up the Hebrew University and had the Zionist feelings and so forth. And refused to convert, which many did in his day. And Dafka gave his lectures before a Jewish organization, the B'nai B'rith in Austria. So he was a proud Jew who had a Moses complex. That idiotic book he wrote, Moses and Monotheism, which he himself said it was idiotic, but he felt compelled to do, was part of his Moses complex. And he sat for days staring, transfixed at the statue by Michelangelo of Moses in Rome. You can find all this in Freud and the Jewish Mystical Tradition by David B. Uh, Bacon of uh, Canada, Beacon Press, if I remember. I, I wrote about it. Uh, okay, so we have now the experience of the desert, which fails. Korach, all the rebellions against Moshe, the orgies, everything fails. The holy people, which is supposed to teach others, copies from others, the cheap discotheques and American TV in, in the state of Israel, which is wrecking the soul and polluting it of Israel. 
uh, we're supposed to teach them holiness, not adopt their cheapness. Uh, terrible, terrible things. Uh, anyway, it fails. That's the story of Book of Numbers, the fourth book. Now all I have to do is explain the fifth book and we're home. The book of Deuteronomy or Devarim, what's its traditional name in, uh, besides uh, Devarim in Jewish literature, which these traditional names uh, may have much more meaning, like Torah Tanim. What do we call the book of Devarim? Good. Mishnah Torah, which is a funny name. It's either a second rendition of the Torah. The, we've baked the cake, and it flopped miserably. So instead of giving up, the Jews keep trying again. We've got to go over the recipe book again, the ingredients, the tools, the fire. Moshe reviews the whole history of the Jewish people. Moshe reviews the law of God, trying to understand it better and analyze it and draw conclusions from it. So it's a repetition of the Torah, but according to the Ramban, as expounded by Reb Salavechik, it's more than that. It's a combination of Mishnah and Torah. It's the end of the written law process and the beginning of the oral law process where Moshe Rabbeinu connects the two. He who gave God's dictated written law to the Jews also starts the expounding of it. As the book starts, these are the words which Moshe spoke, not God. And then Moshe would never put his own words in God's book. So God adds a little, uh, subtracts a little maybe, and says, Moshe, your words at the end are so good that I want to put them in my book. This is the Abarbanel's explanation of the Bahrain. So Moshe starts the Mishnah process. So therefore, as we finish the Torah, we go off in three directions. One direction is historically to the book of Joshua the conquests of the land of Israel, which, thank God, is repeated in our time. There's 21 Arab states. There's time that we again had the one Jewish state. And if they want to kill us to stop it, we won't let them. It's as simple as that. And when the Jews finally stood up and made a state, even though many of them thought they have no use for God and Torah, at some unconscious level they were exhibiting the deepest faith in God and Torah, because to set up a Zionist secular state after 1900 years of no experience in government or warfare or firing was absolutely insane. It was logically insane and theologically divine. That the same protesters who would eat on Yom Kippur at some level of their being had a deep faith in God, even if they were angry at their religious parents and society who they saw so ineffectual in dealing with the problems of pogroms and starvation and so forth. And eventually, this is said by both Rav Soloveitchik and Rav Cook, the deep unconscious religiosity of the seemingly anti anti-religious Zionist secular pioneers, eventually, by acquiring a share in the land of Israel through the great sacrifices made by the secular Zionists, they would also acquire, like Avraham, a share in the God of Israel. And someone like Adin Steinsaltz, and we have some of his articles here, if you like, a uh, great Torah scholar, one of the greatest of the day, was from the ultra-secular Zionist movement and a physicist. And he's now a leader of the Torah. Many of their greatest, a number of their greatest entertainers have now become even Haredi Jews. They went to the opposite extreme. Hopefully the descendants will get back to the middle. So, and, and maybe the most religious person who stayed in Muncie or Borough Park, God forbid, their children might intermarry, or grandchildren or great-grandchildren. So, while, as the Magama also sang, that God may be dead in the Western world, the Richard Rubensteins of the world may proclaim it, but God is alive and well in Jerusalem right now, with more and more people going back to the Torah every day, both Israelis and immigrants. But it's only in Israel, once we're restored, that I think one can find the Shekhinah, God's imminent presence. We have traditions that the Shekhinah descends with the Jews into Galut, 
God feels it's necessary, but he feels bad, and he sticks with him. But that's only when, in my opinion, when it's a forced galut. Once we can go back, I assume God goes back with those who go back. And at a certain level, the experience of God outside of Israel is limited. And the Talmud says anyone who lives outside the land of Israel is as though they live without a God. And anyone who lives in the land of Israel, even if they're not so observant, even among idolaters, has a God. This is at least one Talmudic opinion. So anyway, the Torah goes on to Yoshua, the conquest of the land, which, thank God, is happening again. In fact, we didn't conquer it. In fact, we bought it at exorbitant prices, even though it's our land, not theirs, according to the Torah. And, and they still try to kill us. And the poor Jews of Hebron, innocent, gentle, Talmudic scholars, not Zionists, slaughtered and viciously taken to pieces by Arabs, Muslim Arabs, now have the nerve, and I am not right-wing, by the way, but they have the nerve to say that Hebron should be Judenrein, as Hitler said. If any, and, and so-called liberals, I can't understand this, in America, who would be the first to protest if a black or Chinese person could not live in a certain neighborhood, are ready to acquiesce in this concept of grand Judenrein for parts of the Jews' land itself. It's absolutely a moral abomination. And my own uh, personal solution to the present terrorist problem is every time there's a terrorist act, you build 500 apartments between Kiryat Arba and Hebron. And that may deter them and save lives. They don't care if they're killed. They're ready to die for that uh, odd religion that they believe in. They're going to go to heaven if you kill a Jew. As Mohammed said, if a Jew is behind the tree, seek him out and kill him. He was like Luther. First friendly, then when we rejected his new faith, he turned vicious. All right? and, and if a month or two goes by with no terrorist attack, and Arafat shows he can stop it, even if he doesn't want to, then you pull the Israeli soldiers out of one Arab town. Instead of these grand plans which result in such murder and disaster. And I don't see how anyone, even of the most peace wing persuasions, can object to this. A simple test is given. If it works, fine. If not, we go on building our land. There's no reason we have to feel ashamed of having a land which all together with all the liberated territories, I would call them that, not occupied, liberated, with all of that occupies one, I think it's one eight hundredth of the territory of the Arab uh, lands in the region. We're entitled to that. After contributing more percentage-wise than any other people to the rest of civilization and suffering more than any other people from it, we're entitled to one decent-sized land. And 21 countries is enough for the Arabs. And there was no such thing as a Palestinian nationalism under the Jordanians and so forth. Virtually no such thing. And I personally am not for expelling any Arabs if they're peaceful. And that we should all work together and live together in peace. And they're basically decent people, other than their attitude toward Jews and their problems with their religion. But at the same time, if they're a menace to our existence, it's the most humane and merciful thing to expel them from the country. Instead of uh, uh, putting them in jail and then freeing them 800 for an Israeli prisoner or something and having to go out and murder more people. It's happened already. It's not just theoretical. And, and, and assassins have been members of the Palestinian police. And the so-called police are themselves terrorists. So it, it's just a morally, liberally indefensible situation to advocate human rhyme and, and allowing murder of innocent people. Uh, so anyway, that's the first direction, Yoshua. The second direction, as I explained, from Devarim, from Deuteronomy, we go on to the Mishnah to continue Moshe's oral law process. And the third place we go from Deuteronomy is where? You know. Yeah, you're batting 100. Where do we go from Deuteronomy besides to Joshua and to the Mishnah? physically and conceptually, where else do we go? That's Yoshua, the book of Yoshua. That's the first answer we gave. Where do we go when we finish Deuteronomy? Back to Bereshit. Every Simchas Torah 
As soon as we finish, right away, Bereshis. What's the message? Well, I just explained that we mustn't overdo it either. We must remember the name of this whole, name of the game of this whole Sefer we finished, the Torah, is that it's a messianic world mission to change the whole world to bring all mankind back to where he should have been in the Garden of Eden from the state of Israel. This is clearly the biblical message. Isaiah 2, all nations will come up and ask Yaakov to teach them of, their, of his ways. It's obviously not the written Torah. They have reasonable translations, even though they distort them. But it's the Torah Shabbat Peh, the essence of the Jewish people, which is not Bible. Copying the non-Jews, we like to say the essence is Bible. And Talmud is sort of something you know, on the side. But by the mouth of these words I made a covenant with you, Rabbi Yochanan interprets, by the mouth of these words, by the oral Torah, is the unique covenant with Israel, and that's what will teach the non-Jews. And when I have people try to talk to me about Jesus, I remind them my name is Yaakov. And in Isaiah 2 it says, you're to come up and ask Yaakov, not try to tell him uh, what God is of the Messiah. Uh, so we go back to Bereshit, to remember that our ultimate task is to change and perfect the world. Keep it seal tape say Torah, the Bar Shem Yerushalayim. From Zion shall come forth Torah and the word of God from Jerusalem. And we have a feeling of responsibility to every human being, to the whole world of God, to the ecological systems. But at the same time, we recognize there is a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. We must maintain a certain separatism from the rest of the world. The priest, though he wants the people not to feel cut off from him, if he spends all day with them doing business and watching TV and going to the ball game or an opera or a play or whatever, then he's one of them and he no longer can help them by functioning as their priest. So the Jewish people must on the one hand be open to the world and on the other hand respect those divisions which God has put between them and the nations like intermarriage, kosher foods, Shabbat, and so forth, and in that way they will indeed gain the respect and gratitude of the nations for whom they will really help. And at that point, it is my opinion, the Arabs will accept it too. That the Arabs, in my opinion, are doing some terrible things, but I can understand where they're coming from. And I think if we presented the true model of not just a free Israel, but a holy Israel, a true model of the Torah, the Arabs would find it so beautiful that they'd give up Islam and go along with it. Because Islam is the biggest possible distortion of the Torah. Maimonides says that each religion, other than Judaism, has a wonderful thing and a terrible thing. The wonderful thing about Islam is they never made Muhammad a god, and they have no statues and only worship God, and have deep faith in God, and pray to God. The terrible thing about Islam is it's the biggest lie conceivable on which it's based to take God's own word to Torah and change it. Oh, it wasn't Isaac who was sacrificed to Tishmael. Right, right. right. Christianity, he says, has a great thing. He's speaking, of course, about medieval Catholicism. This may not apply to all modern Christianity. The great thing about Christianity is they never change one word of our, one letter of our Hebrew Tanakh, of the Bible, the Only Testament. They may have mistranslated it, but they never changed it. They'll take a word which doesn't mean virgin, it means a young girl, they'll say it means virgin. But uh, they never change the letter. The terrible thing you say about Christianity is they put God into physical form and said a man was a God, despite the biblical verse, lo ishael, God is not a man that he should change and so forth. And that they worshipped statues and things like that. Now this may not, it's sort of like a mixture of God and other things, and it, it's a controversy whether this is forbidden to a Noahide. But anyway, no Jew can be involved in such things. Right. So that's the message of the whole Torah. It's a message which should inspire that by keeping the Torah properly and studying it, we should be able to transform the whole world from the state of Israel. And every single Jew belongs there. As Avram Fried sings, no one will be left, no Jew will be left behind. And the challenge today in our age is both to come to Israel and help it become a greater state in every way, and at the same time to make it a holy state. Okay, that's enough for the moment.
Any uh, questions or comments? If you want, I can go on to other themes. But I did the whole tour, as I said I would. <laughs> yes. Uh, I was just wondering what you make of Exodus 23, where he says, uh, thou, shall, uh, I will, thou shalt drive out the stranger from before thee, thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor with their God. They shall not dwell in thy land lest they make these sin against me. All right, I can tell you explicitly. I write on this subject. I'm applying it to modern day. Yeah, the word stranger, I don't think, is a correct term there. What it's referring to, yeah. I mean, just looking, let me just uh, see. Is there a chumash in the house? Yes. I had one here before, I hurt. I prefer to look at the verse which you quoted. Exodus 23... What's the rest of it? Yeah, just your last oh, wait, what was the verse quote? Uh, um, Exodus what? Exodus 23. It doesn't give the verse. It doesn't give the verse. All right, Exodus 23 isn't that long. But it'll take us a moment or two. By the way, I don't know the book you're quoting from, but it's a sloppy book yeah. if it doesn't give the exact yeah. verse. That's <laughs> not a good way to He's do things. It for that I know. Nah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, You're not going to worry that he doesn't. He does think he and I think. Yeah, uh, here, no, it's the end of the chapter. I just want to make sure there's nothing in the beginning of the chapter. I will set that. my bounds from the Red Sea, even to the Sea of the Philistines, and from the desert of the river, where I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hands. Yeah, it's right. the end. Now, now, look what this, I don't know who this person is, and I don't want to just criticize for nothing. But I would have a hunch this is an anti-Zionist book. No, never. No. Well, it's a mistranslation. Yeah. There is no verse which says, uh, the stranger shall not dwell in your land. It says, they shall not dwell in I'm your sorry, land. I'm sorry, I put in the stranger because oh, okay. I wanted to. I right. refer then to the book, today. Okay, no, th this is not referring to today. The book... Then it's not his fault. I apologize to whoever it is. You apologize to him, okay. Okay. But to me. But, they uh, shall not dwell. Shall not dwell. Yeah. So, of course, to understand that verse, you have to read the verses before it to see who they is talking about. Yeah. They is talking about, or is the right wing Kahana type book? No. No? I, I don't know. I'm only on the chapter. Yeah, I'm just trying to think why they brought this verse. Okay. Uh, that they is referring to. Uh, I shall send the hornet before you, I hate the word they, it's silly, which shall drive out the chivi, the kanavi, and the chiti before you. But a little by little, so that the wild animals don't increase in the land, I'll set your borders, and I'll deliver them into your hand, and you shall drive them out before you. You shall make no covenant with them, nor with their gods. They shall not dwell in your land. Now, this is referring not to any Gentile or stranger, but specifically to the seven nations. And the seven nations, Maimonides brings specifically, had three options. They could leave idolatry, or leave the land, or fight to the finish. Well, it applies today. No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. It does not apply today. This was a false propaganda of Rabbi Meir Kahana, which I refuted when it came to my attention. This is talking about the idol worshippers of Canaan. Our objection to them is because they worship idols, and we cannot set up a holy state of God in a place where people are worshipping idols. They had three choices. Give up the idols, as the Givonim did, and worked with the Jews. Leave the land, as I think it was the Chiti did, it sailed around Tunisia. We have Talmudic traditions to that effect. Or as the others did, fight, and we'll fight you. The Arabs are 100%, as I just mentioned, not idol worshippers. Therefore, this whole thing does not apply to them. The only thing that applies to them is the adage, he who rises to kill you, kill him first. If anyone tries to kill us, we have to throw them out. If they're peaceful, it's perfectly fine for them to live there because they're not idol worshippers. There would be a problem if Buddhists or Hindus or Shinta, some idol worship came to the land, and some would say Catholicism in the Eastern churches. And at least in the spirit of this, not in the law, the Israel Museum, in my opinion, 
should not waste millions and millions of Jewish dollars which could be used for so much more important things, to dig up old idols and portray them, which our ancestors smashed and buried according to the words of the Torah. This is an example of non-Jewish assimilationist in influence. Even the new Bible Lands Museum, whose director is an acquaintance of mine, uh, in the course of trying to show the superiority of monotheism over idolatry, a huge part of the museum is given over to displays of idolatry, which is human perversion like the Aphrodite code, okay? That's that one. And the Orachayim and others say specifically, there is no prohibition whatsoever for Arabs to live in the land of Israel because they are not idolaters and they will not lead us to idolatry. Ref Cook said the same thing. But if they try to kill us, you got to crack down. But I'm all for peaceful relations with the Arabs if possible. Because otherwise nobody's going to do the work. When they make a strike... <laughs> Your car can't get fixed. Your house can't get built. Will do it. Maybe they're not so good. The <laughs> Easterners, Easterners, yeah, yeah. But the most Arabs aren't. It's my observation. I live next door to Arabs, and I live in a neighborhood which is one of the closest to the Arabs it's possible, the Jewish quarter. Uh, in fact, we find very few explosive charges and all despite the fact that thousands of Arabs every day walk through. And I'm reasonably convinced, while the Arab, average Arab may identify with the bombers and not like us, the average Arab, like the average anything, doesn't do anything about it. And as long as he's at home with his TV and family and Jews treat him nicely in his work and he has enough to eat, he'll be content. The part of the problem is the terrible poverty and the crazy religion. We somehow, I'm not joking, Israeli secular leaders, professors and military, aren't used to thinking religiously. So they can't see that this is a religious problem. And that somehow we have to get the Arabs out of Islam. Why wow, get the Arabs out of Islam? The military man can't think about that, even though they spend billions of dollars on weapons, which are ineffective. And to be effective, we got to get them to be, adopt the Torah and the seven laws of Noah and uh, drop Islam. Uh,